Thanks for coming in, man. It's nice to nice to have you here. It is nice to be anywhere. Thanks for having me. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad we, we reached the bar. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to be here. Yeah. Frankly, it's just nice it's to be nice anywhere. To be anywhere. It's nice yeah. to be out of the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. frankly. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that song. Um, I think it was kind of a reaction in a way. Like it, So it started as a conversation. I was on the road with, uh, with Adam from the Counting Crows, and we had had this conversation that we were at an age where we weren't old, but we were too old to die young. And I think it was Adam that, that might have said that uh, that every day you were one less day mm-hmm. away from dying young, you mm-hmm. know. And I and I thought that was a, a a thought that that struck me in that there's so much sentiment about youth. There's so much idea about tonight we're young and we're going to be young forever and I never want to get old. And I would hear people say like, "Oh, it sucks getting old," and you'd be like, "Oh, but." the alternative is so bleak Mm -hmm. you know there's Mm -hmm. only there's only two choices you have you either get a day older or you don't Mm -hmm. and uh and so i thought it was it was good to write a song about the joy of getting older you know and the privilege that's not afforded to everyone like we've lost friends in our time like before their time that's that that's the line that really stuck out to me when i heard this song was was that line i'm not going to you know uh, read your lyrics back to you but that that line about we've lost friends so young and you have of course in the music industry Mm -hmm. you've seen friends go way early i can only imagine what that does to you as someone who's, who survives that yeah and and we you know we've lost you know in the music business but people that you guys that no one else knows but us but they're some of our closest people mm-hmm. and it's it's more i think it's more of a product of 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 being of a certain age it just starts to happen more you know mm-hmm. like you like you start to just even in the news when you start seeing people die but you start seeing that number next to, to the right of their name and it gets closer and closer to your number mm-hmm. and then you start really i think taking stock and then you know, you have things as you get older that you really are, you don't want to lose. You know what I mean? Like I, like I have a son now. I want to, I want to see how that turns out as mm-hmm. long as I possibly can. I want to see how that goes. How, how old is your son? He'll, uh, he'll be 21 this year. Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. Craziness. Right. So this is a really interesting age because he's, he's grown up. He's a grown up. He's a musician, which oh. is also like, he's going, he's a, he's a, a junior at Berkeley College of Music right now. What does he play? guitar. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's a gearhead. You know, like total, you know, just like gear junkie, which is kind of fun to watch. That must be pretty meaningful for you to have the son. I don't want to say follow in your footsteps, but also playing music. Yeah, it is. And, and like, I, I never really, it was something that he kind of stumbled on and that he wanted to do. You know, like it's never been my intention to try and push anything on him. And mm-hmm. even, you know, to this day, like I only, I never offer any unsolicited advice. Like it's, you know, if he wants to know about a song, I'll tell him. If he wants to know about a mix, I'll tell him. But, you know, I, I'm I'm woefully unprepared. Like if I were 21 years old and I was starting in the music business right now, it is so drastically different mm. than it was 20 years ago. Like the whole mechanics yeah. of how it works. So I wouldn't know what to tell him. I think he's probably more prepared right now to, to start in this business than I would be if you just dropped me off in the world right now. I, you're, I mean, you have a point about that. I speak to a lot of people who, and I mean this with the most respect, had a lot of success at a time yep. when you sold a lot of CDs. Yep. Like I had Matchbox 20 CDs yeah. in my house. Yeah, you know and it I mean? was there was a... There was a, and it literally started, I think, in like 1950 something, and it lasted all the way up until about 1998, mm-hmm. right? Where you played in a band, a guy from a label, that job was to go around the country listening to bands and finding bands would come see you. With a big cigar. Yeah, yeah. yeah almost like that, right? <laughs> and he would come in and he would sit down and he would keep, you know, in our case, he would come and see us and go, you're not ready yet. Oh, that and happened to you guys? Yeah, and then yeah. he would come back a couple months later and be like, well, you're getting better, but you're not, you're not quite there yet. Right. And then you get signed. Then if you're lucky, they play your song on the radio, and if they play it enough times, people come to your show, and then they buy your CD, and then you've made it in the music business. Mm-hmm. Like It is a A to B to C to D transaction. It's very easy. It's mapped out, and it was that way from the beginning of time until it ate its own head and became so bloated. The whole antiquated idea of it just seemed ridiculous and people wanted, they want more and they want it now. Mm. And so then there was that period for a good decade or so where it felt like everybody talked about, you know, how music business was dying and they didn't realize that it was just reinventing itself and it was regrowing. And now Mm -hmm. the relationship that you and I can have with the music that we love and the artists that we love is so much more personal and so much closer. And it's so much more immediate. 
You know, like mm-hmm. we don't have to sit around and wait for one of the three radio stations or MTV or VH1 to, to play something that we want to hear. Mm-hmm. We can pick up our phone right now and listen to everything in the world that we want. Anything that's we ever been it. recorded. Even more so, think about when Matchbox 20 made their first record, how hard it was to get into a studio. Yeah. Like I, re- I remember listening to like, uh, I like Django Reinhardt a lot, like sure, the yeah. greatest guitar player of all time. I think when he made a record, that was like going to the moon. It yeah. was the same technology. And now imagine your band just being able to record in your house with a couple of mics. You and know? not just that, like, you know, I work with, with some really great successful producers like Benny Blanco who's mm-hmm. like probably one of the biggest mm-hmm. and we're sitting in his bedroom in his apartment in New York and he's got a microphone just sitting on the other side of his mattress that we're cutting demos on and he's going yeah that's where Katie's saying fireworks oh good <laughs> You know, it's like, you know, like back in the day, like it, it, like it was it was a monumental task to get pristine sound and it's mm-hmm. got to be super dead and everything, mm-hmm. you know. And now literally you can just throw a 57 on a on an upright piano and yeah. then, you know, and another 57 on your voice and then you make a record out of it. I mean, but even though the, the, the styles have changed and even though we're kind of talking about how things used to be, mm-hmm. I, when I when I listen to this new record, it doesn't sound like a throwback record. Like it seems like you're still you're, you're making kind of vital pop music. It seems like you're, you're making music that reflects 2019. I appreciate that. I you know, I think that I mean in a way there's a conscious effort to be a little bit 80s on the record with just some production choices which in a way kind of is kind of now right which yeah yeah, Yeah. which (laughs) makes it sound and a lot of that was you know was the uh, a sensibility that I share with Butch Walker so like I I did every record before with uh, Matt Serletic that's been like every Matchbox record except the one that we did with Steve Lilly White Mm -hmm. every solo record has been Matt Serletic Smooth was Matt Serletic as much of the sound of you yeah yeah and 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 I think rightfully so and successfully so. It's like, so it's not like a thing where like I'm so glad you get away from, you know. Yeah. It's just it was time for an aesthetic change. And Butch Walker has been one of my really good friends for since the early 90s, back when he was in The Marvelous Three. He's also an, an amazing singer-songwriter in his own right. Mm. This great producer that's worked in pop and worked with bands and understands the dynamics. And so him and I kind of sitting down and having this this thing, like we, we worked on two songs and then we're kind of like, I see an 80s thing kind of happen here. Let's, let's lean into that mm-hmm. instead of getting away from it. Let's like really go there because we're both 80s kids. Like we were 80s radio heads. Like that was everything that we're informed by, you know, has something to do with Cyndi Lauper and Don Henley mm-hmm. and George Michael and In Excess, you know, like all of those things, like every note, every chord, every melody is somewhere buried in that stuff. Is, has your songwriting changed in addition to the song we just talked about, but has your general songwriting changed as you're getting older too? I'm not sure. I mean, I think when I listen back to it, I, I it doesn't sound like, like w- One Less Day doesn't sound like 3 a.m. Yeah. And it doesn't sound like Push. Yeah. And I think in that way it has, but I don't think there's been a conscious effort to make that happen because if if anything, the only thing that I'm really, really adamant about when I'm writing is trying to make it as visceral as possible. Do you know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't try know what and, you mean by visceral. Well, meaning that I try and make it in the moment. I try and like have a Taoist idea about the whole thing where I just like be the leaf in the wind and see where it's going to take me as opposed to sitting down, having an, an idea that I want to adhere to like arbitrarily and be like, okay, I'm going to make this song now. I want to make this kind of thing. So it's generative, like you, you, it's like, it's like Kerouac, like it's I'm about, going to write without thinking. I'm just going to see what yeah, comes try, out. It yeah. tries to be like, just sit at the piano, pull up a melody, just let, let a melody flow. Let the entire melody go before you even write a lyric. Just let it kind of flow out of you until you find it. Mm-hmm. And then you sit down and you kind of, and then craft comes in, mm-hmm. you know? So it's, it's like, if it's, most of it is inspiration. Everything kind of comes from like this, this melody that you kind of hear above your head that doesn't exist yet. Mm-hmm. And then you realize that it's yours. Then it goes into craft, and hopefully each year that you do it and each record that you make, you get a little better at the craft of it. I understand. And you shape it in a little more. But like, I try not to think about what I'm doing. So when I listen to the distance between me 20 years ago and me now, I hear that. But the, the mechanics of how you do it hasn't changed. You sit down, you pick up a guitar, you sit at the piano, mm-hmm. you wait till a melody just really gets you. But in this case now, because I'm trying, I'm running against the ghost of myself that's always next to me, you know, and hopefully a little bit behind me. And so is the ghost of yourself your past successes? Yeah, and you don't want to quite be there. So like now it just takes me longer to get there and that I'll write three or four records worth of songs until I finally get one record that I feel like has it hits all the buttons for me. It doesn't sound like what I've done in the past. Yeah. It sounds like who I am now. That's interesting. And it sounds like stuff that I want to listen to. That's interesting, Rob, because I know people who are haunted by their past success. Yeah, and sure. And it sounds like you're inspired by it. Well, you know I, what I mean? You know, I I want to beat that guy. You know what I mean? Like I want to, like I want to, I want that guy to look at this guy and be like, 
wow, you did good with that. Man, yeah. shit, that was good. You know, good job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of, I'm, I'm happy you called him that guy because the next question I wanted to ask was, it's been 20, 23 years since yeah. yourself or someone like you came out. Like, I don't know if you put that on very often, but when you do listen to that, does it feel like the same person? It doesn't. I, I can't hear it in the sense that, like, I love playing those songs live. It's a shared experience and it's new every night. You're playing for people, you're having a moment, they're having a moment, you're all having the same moment. Yeah. So live, it's a different animal. But the recording exists in a time capsule and all I can hear is the limitations because, I mean, without a doubt, at that time in 1996, I wrote the best songs I possibly could write at that time and we made the best record we possibly could make at that time. Yeah. Then as you grow and you evolve and you look back, you're like, oh, I would have done this and mm -hmm. I would have done this. But it worked. It, and I think it was, it was good time. You know, like we were doing what was kind of happening. It was the only time in our career, even though we've continued to somehow stay above water, it was the only time in our career that what we were doing was what was happening. And I think that perfect <laughs> moment I know what kind you of mean. happened. Because yeah. like we came out with Unwell. Like we had Unwell on the radio. It was like a top five hit. It has a banjo in it. And everything else on the charts is like Nelly and Ludacris. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, then, and then maybe the Backstreet Boys is the closest to a band that's, you know, that's on there. And we're just kind of like floating in there somewhere. Yeah. But like at that moment in 1996, we were the band. We were like what people were listening to. Well, tell me and a story helped. then. Can, can you pinpoint a moment where you knew that you had gone from a guy who was being in a band trying to make hit records to, oh, my God, this thing kind of worked? Is there a moment you can pinpoint? I mean, you know, they, in all honesty, it wasn't until, I think, the second record. When, you, when we put out a second record and we had a single that worked, then we felt like now we're on a track. Because everyone let us know that after that kind of like weirdly monumental success of a first record blowing up like that, this sophomore is never going to happen. Like, this is a thing. It's a fluke. It happened. Save your money. Save your shit. You know what I mean? Like, you're not going to. So it wasn't really until Bent, when we put out Bent, and it, went, it was our first number one single ever, that yeah. we were like, all right, now we're, we're on the ride. You know, like, that first, that first record bought us the ticket, but now we're on the fucking ride, and now we get to, we're going to take it for as long as we can. Oh, my but God. But that said, that's, that's spoken from a point of perspective. So when we started out, we didn't have that kind of perspective. Everything was success. We sold 600 records, 610 records our first week, and we were stoked about it. <laughs> we're like, that's 600 people have our record, you know? Like, then everything was this, this kind of success. But we, we put out one single called Long Day, and it failed miserably. Mm -hmm. And it also, we put it out first. Our record comes out. The day our record comes out, Lava Records that were signed to Folds, and every band on it except for us, Edwin McCain and Sugar Ray get dropped. And they're about to drop us because Long Day that we put out is just failing miserably. And there's a guy named Dave Rossi who is a, uh, a radio programmer in Birmingham, Alabama. And this big, is back big when- market. Huge market. Yeah, right. Birmingham. Yeah. This was back when you could do this. He liked Push, so he just started playing it on his station just because he liked it. Yeah. And it became the number one song in Birmingham in like a week. And we were out opening for the Lemonheads at the time. And we, would, we strolled up, like we were playing with like 200 people, you know, when we played our own gigs. And we show up to the Birmingham Music Hall and there's a line outside the door mm. of just like people wrapped around trying to get in to come see Matchbox 20 cause mm. with this song Push. And that was like... Everything from that moment on mm. started to get like movie crazy, you know. Like we're like it really did feel to sell, movie crazy. Huh? Yeah, like ten thousand a week, twenty thousand a week. Like it just started getting bigger and bigger. And you get these calls. You're just like, and we and we again no perspective. So then we're just like, well, this is how this happens, right? This you know this is like <laughs> totally what's supposed to happen. Yeah. Of course, it's you know. Um, I think so. I think those those are the two moments. One uh, when when this when we actually got a chance to really go out and become a good band mm. and then when we did our second record and we actually could show that we had more songs in us than that record if you're just tuning in i'm speaking with rob thomas who's the lead singer at matchbox 20 incredibly uh, successful solo artist in his own right uh he's here performing music from his new album chip tooth smile we're talking a little bit about songwriting a little bit about is this how, counting how, down how is that what's happening changed. This was counting down. It's counting down to like an I don't know. It's like an ideal. I don't know. But now I have a sense of impending doom. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> this is this is kind of for me to know how long we've been talking. You know what I mean? Like we started this at twenty minutes. I feeling I'm not gonna. I'm not looking at it. I haven't looked at it yet. I'm either. So I'm not too worried about it. It's dead to me now. Let's get rid of it. Yeah. Let's, you know, let's just go. It's to over. The, let's just go outside. It's over now. It's over now. You know, it's done. I want to point out for the radio listening audience, <laughs> Rob has turned his clock. Nothing says great radio like visual gags. <laughs> like, it really, really drives it home. Kids at home love that stuff. Can we talk about Smooth? 
Sure we can. Um, that's a pretty huge song, man. That was a big one, yeah. How did that come about? Um, this is you and Santana. Me and Carlos, we... Um, originally, I wrote it, but I wasn't supposed to sing it. I just wrote it as a writer. Me and this guy, it's all sure. I was, I just, I had gotten off the road. We had been on the road for years. Um, I was living in Soho in New York City and just got a call that this guy around the corner from me, literally like blocks away, was writing this song for this new Santana record. Supernatural. Yeah. It was his big comeback It record. was the big comeback record. But at the time, we didn't know that. I just thought I was going to do something with Carlos, and it kind of felt cool. I thought I was going to have to tell everybody about it because nobody was going to know. Um, and then... Uh, we couldn't, they couldn't figure out who they wanted to sing it. Carlos liked my voice on the demo. He said, uh, I believe this guy, let's get him to do it. Does he sing? And they're like, yeah, he sings. <laughs> yeah. He's, very, and, uh, he's a very successful he's, he's musician. He's doing fine yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah, not to him, I'm not. Like, yeah. to him, he, yeah, he'd to, never been yeah. to Birmingham. Yeah, exactly, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. apparently. <laughs> so, I, uh, so then I went in and, you know, and, then we, and, we, and we did it. And then even then, it was funny because, so I was on the record, but I, the, almost all the record was already done. So I'd, I had heard like the Eric Clapton track, and I'd heard the Dave Matthews track, and the Wyclef track, you know. Yeah. And what was the follow-up single, Maria Maria? Maria Maria, yeah, yeah right, yeah. awesome. Yeah. And I, uh, at the time, like I, would, they started writing about it, and I never got mentioned. You know, like they would go through this whole thing about this new record that Carlos was doing, this the stars, and I was never in there. And I called Paul, who's uh, the guitar player in Matchbox, and my best friend, and I said. I told him this, you know, I'm like, yeah, she's kind of bummed, you know, like I did this, but nobody knows. And he's like, well, Rob, everybody on there is pretty famous. Oh. You're not. Okay. And I was like, that's, that's fair. All right. And then I felt pretty good about it. And then I just, I just walked away thinking, okay, we'll see what happens. And not knowing that ever that it was going to be the single until I'm standing on a street corner in, on West Broadway in Soho. And literally the light goes red. This car pulls up, a convertible car full of girls, and they're blaring smooth out of their car. And I was just like, holy shit. And I called my wife. I'm like, I think, I think that Smooth is the, is the single off this Carlos record. And I called uh, my manager, and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, they, went with, they went with Smooth. They just, they just released it. And then I was, uh, I was in L.A. when I really knew uh, I was in L.A. And Jason, when he was still in Metallica, came walking out of Jason a, Houston? Uh, yeah, he yeah. came out of, a, out of an elevator and was just like, hey, Rob. And I'd never met him. Hey, Rob, man, <clears throat> love that Carlos song. And I was like, all right, this has gone from New York Hot Girls to Metallica. There's something happening there's here. Something like, there's happening. something bubbling here. Yeah. And did it feel like that movie thing again? It did. I mean, and, and what's funny is I, I, I thought that I understood success because we had just sold these records and, you know, we had that big record. But then I realized that what we were was a band that had a successful record. This was a legend having a moment that was cultural. It right. was worldwide. Like, it went everywhere. It was, I mean, that was his thriller that year, right? It was Supernatural. It was nine Grammys. It was, like, just boom, boom. Carlos was everywhere. Yeah. And, uh, and I got to be, like, the, the lead float in that parade. And it's still enduring. Like, what's your relationship with that song now? It's, it's lasted. I don't like to hear it again. Oh, no? But I, but I love to play it. Yeah. Like, I love playing it we're live. Not gonna, we're not going to we play have it great, We have a great worry. time, but I, I don't like to hear it. Um, have you seen the memes and, they, and I think Carl, Oh, yeah, of course. I got, I got one. It has, it, one. it has its own life. Can you just tell people what you're looking Speaking of visual gags. Oh, okay. I've seen this. I, in fact, I think our uh, uh, Pete Gambark, who's the head of A&R at Atlantic, has this on a coffee mug where it says, uh, I'd rather be listening to... And this is awesome, by the way, because I want you to point out like, how much effort it goes into. So it's a t-shirt. It's the t-shirt, but it's the whole thing. I'd rather be listening to... The Grammy Award-winning 1999 hit Smooth by Santana featuring Rob Thomas of Matchbox 20 off the multi-platinum album Supernatural. <laughs> like, if you just said, I'd rather be listening to Smooth, not funny. No. But that? Yeah. Funny. Very funny. Did you see the one that was like the Olympics? It was during the Olympics. Um, Katie, I can't remember her name. Do you remember her name? She was like a swimmer, American swimmer. And she won. She got first place. And the second place swimmer was came in in the amount of was time Carlos it, Santana? it was Carlos Santana. <laughs> Holy shit. The second place swimmer came in in the amount of time it took for your vocals to start and smooth. Really? So like if you if she, when she ended if you start with a gong gong do do no 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 by the time the second place swimmer got in that was when your vocals came in. That's how far ahead she was of everybody. I was about else. to say that sounds like the other girl was just slow. I mean, yeah. that's a that's a it long was the intro. Olympics. That's a long intro. But how are you but like I I, I, um, I still talk about this song. I know it's a bit of a meme, but it's it's, you know, it, I think I went through the same journey with this song that everybody else did. It was a great summer jam, then I was sick of it, and then I revisited it and was kind of like, you know, it's just a good, it's just a nice, it's just a good song. It's not my best song I've ever written, it's not the best song Carlos has ever done, but again, it was another moment where I was standing in the right spot at the exact right time mm -hmm. to, to be a part of something that was, that was bigger than me. 
And like, and now Carlos, I mean, Carlos is my man. Like we, he's my uncle Carlos. Like we talk all the time. We hang out if we're in the same place, we'll go to dinner where he comes to shows and gets up on stage. Like we were just talking a couple days ago. We'll do smooth. Yeah. Uh, The first time he ever, he got up with Matchbox, we didn't. We we started off like smooth. We did the pa da da But then we went into all along the watchtower instead and did that. Um, But we'll do, we'll do smooth. Like he does smooth in his way with his singer and I do smooth my way with my band. Right. Um. But it's it's fun to play and and, it, and it's like a, it's just a weird. It's bigger. There's like me. There's my career, and then there's smooth. Like over here to the right. Like it's this whole other thing, you know. Did it change your songwriting going forward? Like having a big hit song behind you. Did it change the way you wrote songs? Given that you wrote song a song that was that moment. No, I mean because I did that. It, it I really appreciated what it's like to work with other artists. You know, working with Etal, he started with the track so that I had, I think a lot of art really thrives on, with giving like a little bit of boundary. Mm. Instead of just like, if you're open to like, I could just sit down on a blank page, I could write anything. But if you're given a little bit of constriction and say, okay, I want you to write this within this thing, it kind of frees you up to, to really hone in on it. Yeah. Um, and I, I, think, I think it opened up my opportunities in a really big way. Like after that, it wasn't the guy from the Goo Goo Dolls. It was... You know, it was people thought you were the guy from the Goo Goo Dolls or, or the Wallflowers or like you know wherever at the time. Hey, Wallflowers holds up, man. Wallflowers are awesome. Yeah, no, they Jake, are awesome. And Jacob's my buddy. I mean, that's you, you tell him wrong with that. I'm, if I hear anyone ever disrespect the Wallflowers, I stop. So the why would you think that thinking I'm in the Wallflowers is a disrespect to the Wallflowers? I don't know because because so many people sit here. The reason is so many people sit here and and disrespect me. The Wallflowers. I will kill them. They disrespect the Wallflowers. I don't understand that. That's because he's Bob Dylan's kid. That band was solid all the way through. They never did it, and his solo stuff is solid all the way through. Is it ever? Yeah. You know what? This show has changed. Yeah. We're now a Jacob Dylan appreciation show. No, we're actually violently appreciating <laughs> yeah, Jacob yeah, Dylan yeah, right yeah. now. We're punching a man oh right God. now. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God! Somebody get in here! I want to kick you in the dick. <laughs> Uh, so hold on. So people, anyway, you, all of a sudden you went from so, being but then the I, guy. Then I, was, I was Rob Thomas, who was a songwriter. And then I got, started getting calls from like Mick Jagger and Willie Nelson. And I actually got to like work with some of my heroes. And mm-hmm. I never would have gotten that opportunity. So I think the opportunities opened up for me in a really big way. That creation, uh, inspiration, and craft, does that change when you're writing for someone else, when you're writing for Willie Nelson, for Mick Jagger? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think that if somebody wants to work with me, to some degree, they want my point of view. They like something that they've heard me do. And so I shouldn't change my point of view for them. I think I should... You know, I think that subconsciously, no matter what, you're going to think a little bit differently if you're writing a song mm. with someone in mind. But like with Willie Nelson, I, I didn't do that. I spent two days with Willie. We just smoked a lot of weed and played each other's songs. He smokes for weed? For two days. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I didn't know yeah. that. He's, um, um, he dabbles. Oh, yeah. yeah. You introduced him to it. He, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I took him down. <laughs> it was a gateway drug. Um, he, um, we just sat for two days, got really high, played each other's songs, and then when it was all over... He just handed me a notepad because I thought he was, th- that was it. I thought, okay, well, this is great. Mm. And he handed me a notepad with three songs on it. And he's like, you know, these songs you played, I like them. Has anybody done them yet? And I was like, no, I just wrote them. And he's like, I want to do those three. And so it was even cooler than writing with Willie Nelson, having Willie Nelson, my favorite songwriter, an American icon, mm-hmm. do three of my songs just because he heard them and liked them. I was just like, okay, that's. Then I thought it was that was it. I was like, whatever to, happens. You're, you're a country guy. You started in country music. That was right? it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I was grew up in South Carolina, but it was it was all old like Willie and Waylon and Merle Haggard and good Conway stuff. Twitty. You know, uh, these like guys. Hello, darling. Oh man, mm-hmm. nice it's to been see a while. <laughs> it's been a long, a long time, time since I held you. And those videos too, man, with him in the hair, staring like, oh, right into awesome. the camera. It's the yeah. greatest. Yeah, I know. and drunk. You know, yeah. he's drunk. <laughs> like these guys. These guys were like, they had hard lives. They fought, they did drugs, they drank. Mm-hmm. They were like just, and then they wrote these beautiful songs about them. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I talked to Willie and I said, Willie, why? I said, you've been married five times. Mm-hmm. Why would you get married? And he goes, well, Rob, I-, I loved every one of them. And I said, well, what about the one that like, tied you to the bed and set it on fire? He's like, oh, I loved her the most. <laughs> <laughs> Shut down the show. That's the last story I ever need to hear for the rest of my life. Rob, what keeps you from lying on a beach and drinking margaritas, metaphorically? Like, really, I mean, i got to imagine, I'm not being gauche here, but success-wise, I mean, financially, all these things, I mean, you've had a pretty great career. You could, like, I'm, I'm always interested with artists. What keeps them going when the drive to be accepted is over? Well, that's never over. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think a need to be understood... Um, is definitely in, in play there. I think I'm going to write anyway because there's a catharsis, in, a catharsis to it, like to the idea that like it, it's an unburdening in some ways of like just getting something out in a way that I can't explain, but I can if I do it to a melody. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But then also like having the success that I've had, like I'm rich, it's great. Mm -hmm. But now that means that I am free to like make the decisions I want to make based on the music I want to make. I don't have to make any decisions that I that don't feel comfortable with so that I can turn a dollar. I don't have to make any things I don't want to be comfortable with so that I can make sure my kid goes to college. Mm. Like now, this is the gravy train in a way. Mm. Like it doesn't mean that I have to stop trying. I, th I think I have to try even harder, but all the right reasons. You know, like I never have to like be why, like, well, what, what are those reasons? Out. You have to try harder. Just to, to write a great song. That's great. You know, and, and my idea of a great song now is different than my idea of a great song 10 years ago. And then 10 years from now, it'll probably be different as well, you know? Could you, could you articulate it, what your idea of a great song is? Um, no, probably not. Yeah. Do you know, but I think yeah. the idea of like, like every time, I think every time I start a record since my, like a third Matchbox record, I'm like, okay, this is going to be the Nebraska. And then I, we start playing and, and I start writing and I'm like, Dude, I'm not writing Nebraska. You know, like no matter what happens, like I'm, I'm writing uh, Glory Days. I know, like no matter what I'm doing, like I I try so hard. I want to, if even if I have an aesthetic in mind, it just comes out me. Like I love Wilco. I love Jeff Tweedy. Uh, Wilco Schmilko, that last Wilco record was just amazing. I love Father John Misty. I love My Morning Jacket. But if I sat down to do a Ryan Adams song, it would just sound like. Uh, a Rob Thomas song, no mm -hmm. matter what I do. Mm -hmm. So now it's just about me just trying to figure out what that means and then each year trying to make the best version of me that mm -hmm. I can be, mm -hmm. possibly. That's beautiful, man. It is beautiful, isn't it? It really is, yeah. It's, yeah, good, it, it's a good way to go. I just, I love what you said about when you get the, when you know, yeah, you, you got a couple of bucks now or something like I'm so Canadian, I can't say the word rich. <laughs> like, it's incredibly hard for me as a Canadian. It, to, it doesn't feel right saying it, but yeah. but then when I do, it feels free. Yeah, right. So like, yeah, you got, yeah, I got money. He got, he got some money. Um, to, to hear that you are in now pursuit of something greater than that, it's just nice to hear. It, uh, you know what? It feels, it feels kind of amazing, and it feels really good. Like, I didn't realize how long it had been since I put out a record. You know, like, I, because it was like, the last record was in 2015 or 16 or something like that. Like, I didn't even think about it, because I was out on the road for two years, and then I was out with Matchbox for another year, and then I spent this year making the record, and then all of a sudden, four years go by. And in this business, four years feels like it could be an eternity. Like, you could be forgotten mm -hmm. completely. So, like, having a... Uh, I having this uh, a new song come out, but then also the day that my new single came out, I got the call that 3 a.m. was added to classic rock radio. So it was How like, does that feel? It was awesome. Like it was, oh, yeah? it's, it's the whole win, right? Yeah, you guys I mean, are Loverboy. Like being in classic rock radio, if I'm sitting on my couch eating Cheetos and nobody's listening to my music, it, I don't know how I would feel about that. But having a new single that I just finished that's out, you know, playing on radio, and I was like mm. playing Ellen the next day, mm. and then I've got this song in classic rock radio, then mm. it all felt right. Like it felt like everything's kind of lining up where it's supposed to be. I had that moment the other day. I was listening to classic rock radio, and they played that. What was that song? Uh, Tell me all your thoughts, song. God. God. Remember it, them? Yeah, Counting Blue Cars. No. Yeah. Who is that? He's Counting Blue Cars. What's the name of the band? Dishwalla. Dishwalla. I heard Dishwalla yeah. on classic rock radio. Yeah. That makes sense, though, right? Yeah, I guess so. Hey. Yeah. Shout out Dishwalla. Hey, what's up, Dishwalla? There are no wall Flowers. You know, they say that um, the Chinese say that you die twice. Mm -hmm. You die when you have your physical death, and then you die the last time that someone says your name. Dishwalla. We're keeping Dishwalla alive right now. Thanks Dishwalla. For, thanks for you coming go, in. This is fun.